Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast upon your word. We're so grateful for it. We're so grateful for one another. We are so very grateful that we have access to that throne of grace whereby we may receive help in time of need. We know that you fulfill our every need and we just love you and, and praise you for your indescribable grace. Filter out all of that which is not of you, which is of the flesh, which is carnal, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together on Sundays in the second epistle uh, to the Corinthians. Uh, I'm, uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 9. I refuse to uh, take second place. Uh, when it comes to the sovereignty of God, he's either sovereign or he's not God. I think what stands out in these two chapters, chapters 8 and 9, and what we, are, we have seen and what we are seeing is the Holy Spirit's emphasis on zeal uh, among one another, uh, between one another. Uh, within one another. Zeal, enthusiasm, uh, I don't think that's an overblown, uh, like hyper, you know, sort of uh, uh, excite, excited, uh, you know, fervor, or it doesn't necessarily have to be. I think you can be somber and sober, and you can have more zeal and more enthusiasm than uh, you ever thought that you could. We've seen in all, all of our studies and all of the uh, epistles that we've studied through, uh, I have primarily focused on Paul's epistles, which I believe is the very lifeblood of the church, uh, for the church, and of the church. It's God's word, it's not man's opinion, it's not, we're not reading uh, something that's uh, not uh, relevant today. Uh, his word is timeless. It's not something that we're not just looking at the lives of individuals uh, that God speaks about, that some historical events that took place thousands of years ago, even though uh, that's exactly what we see historically it that's the context but there's also a present day application that uh, for us today and in all of these epistles what we've seen without exception it's it's been woven through the new entire new testament like a golden thread and that is that we're under grace not law that we don't live a life of uh, uh, our relationship, our walk with Him, our communion with Him, our, with God, our fellowship with Christ, our communion with God is not one that's, uh, that we perform some duty that we perform out of obligation or some sense of responsibility to a God that we, we believe that we might have to appease because He's angry with us and and, you know, if we don't perform correctly, uh, there may be some punishment lying ahead for us. Or we're being punished because of something rotten that we did in the past. Or that, that God is just dealing with us on the basis of our own performance. That, that Christianity is, is basically an institution that's based upon uh, human merit. There's something dynamic taking place in the lives of these believers at Corinth, which is a work of God. We're looking at how God is working in the lives of His people, His children. 
Now, when I say that, I don't say that casually. Uh, it is, I believe, extremely important for us to understand that we, our primary interest, our primary focus is on what God is doing, how God is working, what He has done, is doing, will do, uh, much more than just some historical account of what some believers back 2,000 years ago did uh, in, as it regards their relationships to one another. That it wasn't uh, their, their grace toward one another was not something that they mustered up within themselves, but it, giving in and of itself is an act of grace here you've got uh, these two natures that we've looked at in, in many a video. Old man, new man, uh, new nature, old nature, uh, flesh, uh, spirit, uh, you know, self uh, versus Christ. Uh, uh, there's many ways of expressing that. But I have suggested to you folks that we are not single-natured individuals, but we are Biblically dual-natured individuals, uh, two natures in constant conflict with one another, where that uh, the things that we want to do, we, we, we see we don't do, and the very things uh, that we don't want to do, oftentimes we see, uh, we find ourselves doing those very things. Uh, it causes us to question and doubt our own uh, value, our own sense of, of worth, in, in all of this uh, relationship with God, and, and it just leads us down a destructive path of man-made bondage to the law, uh, to sin, self, the world, uh, Satan, uh, the world religious system based upon human merit, and just as in everything else, grace, when it comes to giving, great God's grace is not only relevant, it is the, the engine, you could say, behind it all. God loves a cheerful giver. You know, you got two people out here, brothers A and brothers B, brother B, brother A and brother B. I, I don't want to use names like Joe, or Joe and Fred, Bill and Bob. I don't want to do that. Some of you out there may be named, you may be Bill and you may be Bob, and I don't want you to... You know, but just for the sake of example, you've got Brother A and you've got Brother B. Now, Brother A, Brother A, well, it's, it's, oh, poor me. You know, God is just not meeting my needs. You know, everything in my life just tends to go wrong. You know, my, my life is just all work, sacrifice, no play. You know, it makes Jack a dull boy. You know, my uh, walk in my relationship with him is, uh, is, is shallow because of the flesh. Um, not sure God fully accepts me all the time. You know, I try to believe that, you know, as, you, as you've heard, you know, I try to believe that we're, I'm, I've been accepted in the beloved, that he loves me, that I'm his child, I'm a child of the king. You know, I may be the prodigal son, but, you know, uh, I'm his. I'm, I belong to him. He belongs to me. Uh, there's nothing that I can, I can't shake off Christianity any more than I could shake off, you know, uh, a dog could probably shake off his fleas because I have a new nature. I didn't always have a new nature. Uh, before regeneration took place and, and uh, before I was quickened to life, uh, you know, I just, it was, uh, there was no, nothing there to substantiate any, any type of relationship with God. And so, therefore, it was just the old man constantly, this was who I, you know, this is what manifested itself uh, uh, primarily most of the time. But then something happened. God did something. Not me. God did something. And I was born again from above by the will of God, not according to the will of the flesh. 
Uh, he quickened me to life. Uh, it's no longer, oh, poor me. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Uh, his grace is indescribable. Uh, I don't have enough time in the day to tell you just how indescribable it is. And now that creates in me a zeal and an enthusiasm which comes into contact with this whole section of 2 Corinthians, this whole, these two chapters as it concerns the matter of giving. I'm a cheerful giver. Maybe I wasn't before, but I am now. And I want to clarify, just as I've said in previous videos, that I don't believe that giving is just limited to currency uh, or even property of, of, of some type. That the giving can be your time. Uh, you know, the, you devote yourself to, you sacrifice your time, your energy, your, your efforts on, on whatever to give to someone in need. And I believe with every fiber of my being that every single one of you Christians out there, I would bet my life on it. If I, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I don't, I don't, it's never worked out very well for me. But if, if I was a betting man, I would bet that every single one of your needs are being, not only have been, but are being and will be met by God. And they have long before you ever even understood God was involved in your life. Now, that's what I believe. I do believe that God is sovereign. I do not believe that man is if that makes me, if that shocks you, well, I'm, I'm shocked back that it would shock you. I believe that we're looking at the results of God's work in the lives of these believers at Corinth and with the application for us today that God is working in the same way. I want to go to the text, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, we're going to start looking at, at it from verse 1. We've already been looking at, at grace and how God's grace was bestowed upon the churches in Macedonia. Uh, now about the service to the saints, and I'm going to be reading from the Berean Study Bible. I believe it's translated better uh, for this. About the service to the saints. There's no need for me to write to you. Stop. That's verse 1 automatically we tend to just read that and automatically our instincts are to just look at that as well, this is this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians and that's true I'm not gonna deny that I do believe though without a doubt underlying the text there is we're looking at the Holy Spirit speaking to us. This is God saying now about the service to the saints. There is no need for me to write to you. Now that seems kind of odd. Seems like, you know, I mean we're always constantly told to, to put one another in remembrance of things and, and it's not often that you see that. Now you do see that elsewhere in Scripture and I don't have time to cover all the bases on that. But What I'm seeing in this text here, as we start out in chapter 9, is besides the fact that giving is a grace, it's a grace of God, uh, we are encouraged to participate. We, we've seen this, and we will continue to see this. Uh, to participate in a grace which we have received. We've received that grace. I don't think any one of us can walk around say, and, and walk around saying, oh, "Well, you've received it, but I haven't." I'm told that we are lacking, coming behind, in no spiritual grace. Okay, 
That's what my Bible says. What's amazing, and I think you're going to find amazing as you go through down through chapter 9, keep your eye open because what you're going to see is God boasting in us. God is boasting in you and me. Well, wow, Steve, I, man, I, I don't know about that. I, you know, are you kidding me? I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't hardly see how that's possible given, you know, what, you know, my life's like today and the things that I, I did today or the things that I do or, or the things I haven't done or, or whatever and just shut up, okay? Just shut up. I say that politely. We can go through, folks, our lives, doubting God, what He said, every step of the way, if that's what we, want, if that's what you want to do. I believe there's a direct relationship between grace and giving, and zeal or slash zeal slash enthusiasm. Zeal is not a word we commonly use in the English language today, you know. Zealous. You know, we, we're more likely to say enthusiastic. And the heart. Folks, it, it's a matter of the heart. If you, I've often said this, if, if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, if, if you're doing something out of obligation, you're not doing it because you love Him. Don't do it. If it's your desire to go to the mission field, that's wonderful. Uh, I would suggest you make sure that you know what, you're, what kind of message you're carrying. That's extremely important. But don't do it to save souls, because you may not. Do it because you love Him. You know... The Word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. You know, it, it's able to, to pierce your heart and expose your heart for what it truly is. But you, we need to be careful when we talk about that because the, the, the old man, the heart is deceitfully wicked. I mean, it, there's no words to describe it. And you have an old man. You know, the, the difficulty I think many Christians have, first of all, if even those who do understand that we have two natures that are in conflict with one another, you know, it's the question is, well, how do I function more out of the new man and, and the old man? Well, I want to give, but I don't want to give. You know, I want to give. I want to help people, but I don't want to help people. You know, I want to offer my time, my services, my my talents, my skills, my, in whatever capacity. You know, you can serve in many, you can serve the body of Christ in many, many ways. And God gives grace concerning these gifts. These, these are gifts, these are graces. Okay, it's there, nothing is, out of, uh, is given to you to do out of obligation. That's law, folks, that's law. It's the wrong mindset. I think that what we're seeing in the text is that the Holy Spirit, the only thing that he approves of here in the matter of giving and service to the saints, and the reason why that it's not even worth writing to them about is because it's, it's pretty much a given that this is what the new man does. And that the Holy Spirit, he, the only thing that he seems to be approving here is zeal among one another. we've seen that the Holy Spirit's emphasis is on equality. And I, I pointed out that's not Guyana type stuff or, or whatever, or Jim Jones kind of type. That's not, it's not some commune off in the jungle someplace. That equality is not Christian communism. I believe that that is primarily speaking of that which is spiritual. It's a spiritual equality. God 
And not only does he meet every single believer's needs, without exception. Now, you may believe that, you may not. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell you that if you are a child of God, God is meeting every single last one of your needs, even when you don't know that he is. Now, you, now if you have an argument with him and you want to take it up with him that you, or that you don't feel like that that's the case, be my guest. Have at, I can tell you, you, it's not going to get you anywhere. The, but the fact of the matter is, is that God is meeting every single need in your life, both physical and spiritual. If he wants you rich, you'll be rich. If he wants you poor, you'll be poor. If he wants you to see, you'll, be, you'll see. If he, wants, if he wants you blind, you'll be blind, folks. That's just the fact of the matter. We don't want to believe that, though. We have a hard time believing in those terms or functioning in a body you know with a mind that thinks in those terms our body our mind maybe want to go one way and our body wants to go another folks you are in a constant conflict between the spirit and the flesh but we don't walk according to the flesh we don't we're not to walk according to the flesh we're to walk according to the spirit well how do we do that well, we don't walk according to law I, I'll suggest that walking according to the Spirit is walking according to grace. Walking according to the flesh is walking according to law. I don't think it's, there's nothing complicated about that. It makes perfectly sen perfect sense in, in light of everything else. We're going to look at a, at a verse in the Greek here. Uh, pick one out. I'm going to look at it in particular, but because it's, I think it's a commonly misinterpreted interpreted verse. Uh, so I'll give you my opinion on that and for whatever it's worth. I do know that God, the Holy Spirit, did not even mention money here. Okay? I don't know what it was they collected for the saints in Jerusalem. Furniture, I, I don't I Did they have a caravan, you know? I don't know. Uh, I can joke all night about it, you know, or all day about it being, you know, canned goods and dehydrated foods and, all, you know, whatever else. MREs. Uh, folks, it doesn't say. And I think the, the reason it doesn't is because giving is giving. It doesn't matter. It's not as, as much about what you're giving God is meeting all our needs, the needs of His people, both physical and spiritual, without fail. Now, so there's a lot of activity going on. The word cheerful, God loves a cheerful giver. The word is, is uh, uh, hilaros in the Greek. It's where we get our word hilarity. God loves a hilarious giver. Well, why wouldn't he? Because it is the natural manifestation of the sinless new nature to do that. It's not the flesh. The flesh doesn't answer to that. It's a, this whole matter of giving is, it's a non-reluctant Giving. You're not giving reluctantly. You're not giving begrudgingly. You're not giving without with any regrets. You're certainly not expecting anything to in return. Love, the very definition, and this is just my own personal, you know, of love, agape, love is to, is the giving of oneself, not your stuff, but primarily. You know, hey, if you want to give someone a sofa, hey, that's fine. I mean, they need a sofa, give them a sofa, okay? But it's a giving of oneself for the ultimate good of another, expecting nothing in return. When we preach, the, when I preach the gospel, and I just, to, to the air, so that his sheep will hear, 
it's, I'm not expecting anything. In, I have no idea how God is working in that realm. It's, it's, it's really pretty much an invisible realm to me. And I, I'm not, I haven't, I'm, haven't been made, I'm not privy to that. Uh, God didn't uh, think I needed to know that, all those details. Probably couldn't handle all the details. You, no expectations because his sheep will hear. You have absolute confidence his sheep will hear. No disappointment when they don't. No disappointment. One of the things that I see in chapter 9 that I think you're going to love is the fact that what, you actually, what we actually see there is there are those who are not participating in this ministry of grace which could very well be exposed, for lack of a better expression, pointed out, you know, well, they did, they helped, but they didn't, they didn't help. These, they, these ones helped, but these others, they didn't help. And God, I think what you're going to be surprised to see is God is concerned that that not happened. If, you, if you're one of those who actually believe that it's an obligation to give, and that you score points by doing it, or you earn brownie points, you know, heavenly stars in your crown, whatever, you know, by giving, if that's what you believe, and if that's what motivates you, I would step, take a giant step back and I would question your motive for doing so. Are you doing it to expect some something in return? Because what you're going to get in return is probably not what you expect. And that's that tough verse that I told you about that I, I don't think they translated correctly. You know, I'll give you the Greek on that. You can, make, you can decide for yourself. But we've seen that both the giver and the receiver are, are blessed in, in this context of giving here. But you're going to see that... Uh, I believe you're going to see that non-participation in this ministry, uh, there's no public shaming to, to take place. You don't shame them. Not, o not only do you not shame them, but you don't try to outdo them. You don't covet this gift in, to, to, the, in, to the extent that, well, you know, this guy, he, he, he gave, yeah, he gave, he, he, he really, he gave pretty well, and man, I, gosh, I, but I can outdo that, and so, you know, I got to, you and me both know, I think you and I both know, you and me, you and I, however you say it, that motive plays a factor, is a, is a factor in all of this. Why do you do the things that you do? Now, I, as I pointed out, the old man's going to do nothing but sin. The new man is going to do nothing but righteousness. But we, as believers in Christ, as as horrible as that conflict is, which is is, it is so, and is not only is it real, it's the very thing we're going to be delivered from someday. It's we look forward to being delivered from this body of sin and death where there is no more conflict. We leave the old man. The old man's not going to heaven. God's not cleaning him up, and he's not going to heaven. You're told to reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus your Lord. Romans 6, 11, first command given you. First command given. I pointed this out numerous times. First command given after Acts in the New Testament. I think we're looking at the working of God in the lives of his elect when after he regenerates them, quickens them to life, and reconciles them to himself. Well, he did that through the blood of his cross. But you come to realize in your own experience that you've been reconciled to God. That this grace, folks, you can't separate it from the doctrine of total depravity. It's the very reason that God gives you grace. We can't do anything to achieve salvation on our own merit. Nothing. 
and I use the term salvation in the sense of eternal life. Election is, uh, which many Christians hate that word, such a comfort to every, every Christian I've ever met that had his head screwed on straight. Election is that eternal act of God whereby he and his sovereign good pleasure and on account of no foreseen merit in the person chooses them to be the recipients of grace and of eternal salvation. Everyone on earth experiences the blessings of God to some degree. He gives a common grace to the non-believers alike and believers alike. That's in Matthew 5. You'll see that he gives that grace, that common grace. But not everybody receives the gift of salvation, which is an entirely a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians chapter 2. It's been a while since we went through that marvelous epistle of grace and comfort. This ministry, just in the time that I've been doing it, I've talked about this, just our, how that we're complete in Christ. Nothing lacking. Every need met. That's, that's a hard one. It, it truly is. It's, it's easy, folks, to say, oh, oh, God, poor me. You know, I do all this for others. They never do anything for me. God is just not meeting my needs. I just, you know, I, it's just kind of like he just forgot all about me. He's, he's all these wonderful, nice things for all these other people. But man, when it comes to me, it's just a mess. I don't see any, I don't see him doing anything good in my life. Nothing is a tragedy. Even that, if you want to call that a tragedy. I, but nothing is a tragedy from the Christian standpoint. I would, I would highly recommend that every single Christian on earth take and just strike the word tragedy from their vocabulary because it does not apply to you, okay? There is no tragedy in the life of a child of the Most High God. Not one. Not one. The sin issue has been settled forever. We've been accepted in the beloved. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenlies in Christ. We see in the t very text we're looking at the indescribable grace. Praise God for His indescribable grace, His peace, joy unspeakable, and full of glory. No wonder zeal and enthusiasm is what the Holy Spirit seems to be emphasizing as of greatest, the greatest importance here when it comes to the matter of giving and service to the saints, which you shouldn't, we, which there's no reason to even talk about it. The Holy Spirit, not Paul, there's no need for me to write to you. You know this, you know this. For I know your eagerness to help. And I have been boasting to the Macedonians that since last year you and Achaia were prepared to give and your zeal has stirred most of them to do likewise. Your zeal. How'd they, how'd they get the zeal? How do you think they got the zeal? God's grace. Verse 3, but I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove empty, but that you will be prepared, just as I said. Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, to say nothing of you, would be ashamed of, of having been so confident. If you do not want to participate in this area of, in, in which God is working, to meet the needs of his saints. And there's no shame. There's no shame. Now that's, you know, I mean, I don't know how many preachers would, are actually too excited about standing up and telling you that, but that's it's just the truth of the matter. 
there's always going to be someone. God always is, has someone out there to meet your physical and spiritual needs. Someone. He's going to do it. Now, it may not be exactly what you want. And many times, I think he meets our, the needs that he meets are, they can be, appear to be things we really don't want. Have you thought of that? Giving to the saints. When they, when they brought those gifts to the, of grace to the saints in Jerusalem, I wonder what they brought. Kind of makes you wonder what they brought. What did this person need? What did this saint need? Maybe something he didn't want, but he needed it. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you, visit you beforehand and make arrangements for the bountiful grace that you had promised. This way your grace will be prepared generously and not begrudgingly. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows generously will also reap generously. And I know, I know that that sounds to you, it's got us to you sound like a verse, an investment verse, okay? Just you know, sow 100, you get 1,000. You know, sow, sow 10, you get 100. I, you know, sparingly or bountifully, it's, it's kind of, there's, you get a return here, and the return is going to be more money. I don't think the return that you get is more money. I think it's, it's more blessing. If you look at this in the Greek, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, this now, the one sowing sparingly, sparingly also will reap, and the one sowing upon blessings, upon blessings also will reap. The word is you, you like, Eulagelion, uh, the word is blessing, okay? Blessing. Each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not out of regret or compulsion. For God loves a, a hilarious giver. Some, I believe, have a special gift of giving. It's, I think it's one of the gifts. Uh, I think we're all called to participate in this work that God is doing in the ministry to the saints and the service to the saints and, and grace and, you know, toward one another. But I believe that there are those who, that God is particularly blessed in that area. And, and thank God, I think, you know, thank God for these people because... Uh, it is a. It must be a sacrifice on their part. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, in all things, at all times, having all that you need. Wow. Sure, it sure don't seem like, you know, somebody says, sure don't seem like I got all I need. I actually think that every one of us, I, I say to you folks that I think, you know, as I suggested earlier, I think, you know, God meets all of our needs. He's always, always has, always is, is doing that, always will. Uh, but I think it's greater than that. I think, I, th I think he goes beyond just the meeting of our needs. I don't think we are capable of even understanding, fully comprehending the care and the concern that He, our God, has for us. Impossible. I, I just don't think we have it in us to do that. Even as new creations in Christ, we cannot so fully comprehend just how much He cares for us and everything that He takes us through that He holds our hand through, that He guides us through. The riches that we have in Him. 
How could there not be enthusiasm? How could the Holy Spirit not be emphasizing enthusiasm or zeal as, as this is the result, God says, of the my working, my working, not y'all's working among yourselves and where I'm not even in, like involved in the picture here. This is what I'm doing in the lives of my people. Want to participate? Because no one's a loser. No one comes out on the losing end. Well, I'm going to stop it. i got to stop it right here. I love you all. I truly do. I, I pray for you all constantly. You're constantly on my mind. Uh, I'm going to try to answer, get back to answering more questions and comments uh, more than I have. I haven't been able to much lately, and I apologize for that. Uh, do join us on Wednesdays for our study on Wednesday nights. Until next time, this is Steve. Rest in Him. Thanks for watching.